all for being here today. Um, this is uh, Zach Hansen's PhD thesis defense. He didn't put that on his title, but um, Zach has been here since uh, summer 2013, so five and a half years, so relatively quick PhD. Um, I first heard about Zach at AGU exactly six years ago when he was at Utah and his advisor, Steve Kruger, approached me and said, um, I have a student for you. <laughs> and uh, hmm. uh, Zach at the time was looking at uh, high resolution cloud resolving model simulations, but he was very excited about getting to do his own cloud resolving model simulations, which is what I sold him on. I showed him a global map of lightning and said, you know, we're going to figure out why uh, <coughs> this looks the way it does. We haven't completely figured it out, but uh, we've definitely done some interesting stuff along the way. Um, so the project that I gave Zach to work on, I had um, written a postdoc proposal about a while before and done some research on, um, but I got distracted by looking at convection over the ocean which is kind of historically um, where more of the theory related to convection has been done in that area for whatever reason. I think to some extent it's chance, um, but uh, more, yeah, more theory about atmospheric convection has focused on convection over the oceans, um, maybe partially because there's easier boundary conditions and maybe just coincidence of the way that scientific communities evolve, but the idea is these kind of more the theoretical ideas are only starting more recently to be applied over land. And Zach is contributing to this burgeoning area. Um, so Zach has been really fun to work with. He was very excited from the beginning to do simulations. Um, and more, more recently, he's gotten more excited about contributing scientifically. He's bravely taking on doing a postdoc <laughs> in China. <laughs> yeah, without yeah, ever having been there before without ever having been there before. Yeah. Um, and watching Zach get excited about his project and um, be persistent about it and continue to contribute has been very rewarding. And I'm excited to uh, see what Zach comes up with next in China. So, <laughs> yeah, thank you. And how he influences other people's research. He's uh, also a very um, constructive group member in general for other members of the group. So. Thank you. Yeah, so today I'm going to talk, be talking about uh, the research topic that I've focused on for my five and a half years here, which is this land-ocean contrast and convective intensity. And we view this contrast using proxy data because it's pretty hard to observe strong intensity updraft velocities, which is what we kind of describe as our convective intensity. So we use lightning flash rate as our proxy for convective intensity. And so that's these two maps. Sorry, just the stick. That's these two maps here. This is the log of lightning flash rate over the entire planet, or between 45 north and south, or maybe 36 north and south, sorry. But the log of lightning flash rate, and then this is the log of lightning flash rate divided by climatological precipitation. And we can pretty clearly see in both of these cases, there's no land mass turned on, but here's South America, here's Africa, here's South America, here's Africa. You don't need a land mass to see where the continents are. Lightning is much more frequent over land than it is over the ocean. And because we use lightning as a proxy for convective intensity, we come to this conclusion that convective intensity is more intense over, or is higher over land than it is over the ocean. And so our general goal is to understand mechanism, mechanisms that control the intensity of tropical convection. So understanding the mechanisms that cause this land ocean contrast would be kind of a natural place to look. What characteristic of land gives us stronger convective intensity? Um, and so yeah, I just want to clarify, the amount of precipitation, that's this trim 3B42 uh, map here, is not equal to lightning. So it's not just that there's more storms over land, or more storms over land than there's more lightning, it's that there's stronger storms over land. And so the reason why we think land has stronger storms is that lightning is tied to updrafts and ice quantity. So this is my high quality MS paint drawn thunderstorm. Um, here's a neg, this is approximately a, uh, a thunderstorm is approximately an electric dipole, so it's negatively charged in the lower and mid free troposphere and positively charged in the upper free troposphere, and that's because falling gravel collides with rising water vapor and water molecules, and it shears off the electrons. So the water vapor and molecules become positively charged, the gravel is anomalously negatively charged. If you have an electric dipole, you're going to get lightning. 
Um, and so the dipole is naturally going to be enhanced if you have a faster rate of collision. So if you have stronger upcaps, you're going to get a lightning enhancement. And also if you just have more ice, you're going to get lightning enhancement. And so the reason why we think ice is also tied to updraft velocities is that ice is related to supersaturation, and supersaturation itself is known to be related to the updraft velocity of the storm. So then why do we see differences in convective intensity? Um, the first, oh, I've broadly categorized them into four categories, but these categories pretty much overlap to some extent. Uh, the first is that entrainment variations between land and ocean could explain that. So that's maybe land is entraining less environmental air into a thunderstorm core and thus diluting it by a smaller amount. If you have less dilution, you're going to have stronger updrafts and stronger thunderstorms. The second is that surface hydrogeneity is going to result in enhanced convection. They can result, or they have been proposed to result in enhanced convection just by having some ideal size of surface flux or, or island size. But they can, or they can also theoretically result in greater cape than any individual surface homogeneously. So if you have two different surfaces, you can get a greater cape value than just one surface. We test this and find that that's not necessarily the case. Uh, also, just potential cape variations between land and ocean. So this is like the absolute value of cape being different. If you have greater absolute cape, naturally you're going to get greater updraft velocities. And then finally, aerosol effects may change the strength of convection and lightning flash rate. However, in my work, we haven't gotten to test that yet. And I will luckily be able to test that at Nanjing University in China. So I've explored these three categories. So the first is entrainment variations over land and ocean. The second is surface, heterogene surface heterogeneity, <coughs> resulting in enhanced convection. So in my case, I test the effect effectiveness of surface heterogeneities resulting in enhanced cape. The next is I test a uh, hypothesis for potential cape variations over land and ocean under the somewhat simple assumption that land is drier than ocean in the free troposphere. Um, that also turns out to not be totally true, but dryness does affect cape in a positive manner. And then I don't show any aerosol tests in this talk. So here's the general organization of my talk. Um, the first is that higher surface bone ratios. So the bone ratio is the ratio of sensible to latent heat flux over land are examined as a possible mechanism to influence entrainment. So entrainment is, again, the mixing of free tropospheric air into a convective plume. The idea is that as you get a higher surface bone ratio, you're going to get a deeper boundary layer. A deeper boundary layer had been proposed to produce wider clouds, and then you'd expect less effective entrainment into a convective core if you have a wider cloud. Uh, the next thing I test is the enhanced diurnal cycle and surface temperature over land and ocean that could potentially result in higher overall cape when interacting with uh, oceanic convection. Sorry, the enhanced diurnal cycle over land uh, could result in a higher cape when interacting with oceanic convection. I do show that cape doesn't actually increase. Um, this is due to boundary layer quasi equilibrium. That is, the fluxes out of our boundary layer are being perfectly matched by the fluxes into the boundary layer. So the moist static energy of the boundary layer isn't changing. And then the final thing I test is free tropospheric dryness that can create greater cape in drier regions. I show that this does work in a variety of cases. However, to connect it back to the land ocean contrast, uh, more work is definitely needed. So the first mechanism I'm testing is that higher surface bone ratios are associated with less entrainment. So again, I said the surface bone ratio is the ratio of sensible to latent heat flux. We can think of this as a sort of a land boundary layer that has a higher surface bone ratio. If you have a higher bone ratio for the same net flux, you're going to get a deeper boundary layer. And if you have an ocean boundary layer with a lower surface bone ratio, the idea is if you have a deeper boundary layer, you're going to get a wider updraft. That wider updraft will condense into a wider cloud, and then presumably you would get less core entrainment from the environment if you have a wider cloud than if you have a narrower cloud. And so then our overall question is, do high intensity updraft velocities increase with increasing entrainment? Entrainment can influence the effect of cape of a plume, and all thunderstorms in the tropics experience a, at least some entrainment. Um, we describe the rate or the effect of entrainment with this plume equation here. So this is the change in moist static energy of an updraft or plume with height. It's a function of the entrainment rate, the environment's moist static energy, and the plume's moist static energy. So we know that the environment's moist static energy is always less than that of the plume. So for any entrainment rate, this will decrease the moist static energy of the plume as you rise up. Um, and so, so then the real question is, how do we describe this entrainment rate? If entrainment is inversely proportional to boundary layer depth, that is, entrainment decreases as you get a deeper boundary layer, you'd expect a higher surface bone ratio to produce more intense convection. 
But if you find that entrainment is independent of bandelier depth, that is, you just divide it by some certain depth, and it's kind of uniform for any bandelier depth, you would expect convection to be about the same strength over land and ocean, at least by Bowen ratio standards. Yeah. And so this is just a schematic. You get some mixing into the environment from entrainment. And so now I'll give you my Bowen ratio take home messages. The first is that we test the response of convective intensity, in this case, high percentile updraft velocities, to Bowen ratio in a cloud resolving model. We find that these high intensity updrafts are not sensitive to the Bowen ratio, that is, our low Bowen ratio simulations have the same convective intensity as our high Bowen ratio simulations. And then our, finally, our results could be explained by entrainment that is insensitive to boundary layer depth. So this initial tested hypothesis that uh, deeper boundary layers would result in less entrainment turns out to not be true in our case. So we use the system for atmospheric modeling to simulate our thunderstorms. Um, the system for atmospheric modeling is a cloud resolving model. Um, it is, in our case, run in three dimensions with periodic boundary conditions. So this is a kind of an image of clouds in our simulation. They're red because that's what clouds look like. Uh, <laughs> um, these thunderstorms here are connected in this domain to this thunderstorm here, so it can propagate horizontally through the domain, which is basically a globe in a box. Um, and you can use fixture interactive sea surface temperatures, uh, fixture interactive radiation schemes, you can use different microphysical packages, uh, different resolutions, different domain sizes. In our case, we do use fixed sea surface temperatures because it gets to radiative convective equilibrium much more quickly that way. And so for our Bowen ratio study, we use radiative convective equilibrium simulations, that's RCE. Um, RCE in the Cardozoic model can be, can be viewed as a statistical equilibrium where convection is balancing the radiative cooling. There's a plot of this here. This is the moist static energy of the 500 hectopascal level versus time in our uh, simulation. We can see that as time goes on, the moist static energy drops quite rapidly, and then it kind of stable, stabilizes out. And after day 30 or so, every single following day is approximately the same statistically. So this is our statistical equilibrium that we call RCE. Um, we alter the Bowen ratio in our simulations by uh, changing the evaporative conductance param parameter of the bulk uh, latent heat flux equations. So that's this equation here. So latent heat flux is equal to some evaporative conductance parameter, some transportation contents, constants, uh, the horizontal velocity, and then some difference between the saturation mixing ratio and the environmental mixing ratio slightly above the surface. And so to change our Bowen ratio in our simulations, we just lower the evaporative conductance parameter. And so the ratio to sensible and latent flexes will change. Um, an issue with that is if you just start with the same sea surface temperatures, by drying out your boundary layer, you're going to get a much deeper boundary layer. And boundary layers cool dry adiabatically. So if you deepen your boundary layer, you're going to get a cooler free troposphere. And cooler free, and free tropospheric temperature is a known control on convective intensity. And so if all we do is just raise our, uh, raise our Bowen ratios and keep the same SST, we'll get this cooler free troposphere. And having a cooler free troposphere will mean we get weaker updrafts. To account for that, we raise the Bowen ratio in our simulations. So we go from 300 Kelvin to 305 Kelvin. And so this is the saturation moist static energy of our simulations. This dashed line, while the red line and the blue line in solid are the moist static energies. Uh, saturation moist static energy is proportional to temperature. So here we can see the temperatures in the future of the are approximately the same in both simulations. So once we've changed that uh, Bowen ratio and raised the sea surface temperature, we do find that uh, boundary layer depth is higher with high SBR. Like cloud width hasn't changed as was predicted initially. Um, so the Bowen ratio in our low SBR case is about 0.08. This is about the same as it is over the oceans. In our high surface Bowen ratio case, this is about 0.39. This is a little bit drier than tropical, but close to tropical. <clears throat> um, the boundary layer depth in our ocean simulation is 475 meters. And in our high Bowen ratio simulation is about 1,025 meters. Cloud radius at the level of free convection is a little bit lower in our low Bowen ratio simulation than in our high Bowen ratio simulation. But when you get to levels slightly above that, so the level of maximum cloudiness as measured by cloud water in our simulation, the cloud loads aren't really different. And actually, they're slightly higher in the low Bowen ratio simulation. And so when looking at high percentiles of vertical velocity, we find that the convective intensities in our simulations are approximately the same. This is a cumulative distribution function with uh, higher percentiles going down the y-axis. 
So this is the 90th percentile, the 99th percentile, the 99.9th, and so this is the 99.99th percentile, 500 hectopascal vertical velocity. <laughs> we can see the red line and the blue line basically overlap. High percentiles of vertical velocity are not really changing in those two simulations. So then the question is, why isn't Bowman ratio uh, changing the convective intensity? Is entrainment changing? And so we diagnose the potential entrainment of our simulations using a parcel model. We use a simple convective 1D plume model uh, to produce the maximum updraft velocity for a spectrum of entrainment rates and condensate loading. So this basically calculates the effective cape realized by the plume and then what the potential updraft velocity is associated with that. And so again, we're using our plume equation here and then we use different entrainment uh, parameterizations to see which one works best. And so this is kind of a schematic of what entrainment does to a plume. So here's again our saturation moist static energy, these right hand red and blue lines, and this is the environmental moist static, uh, the moist static energy versus the saturation moist static energy. This is uh, basically a plume's unentraining moist static energy. And so if a plume is not entraining any environmental air, it's going to conserve its moist static energy as it rises. However, entrainment does ex exist in all convective plumes. And so if you look at some different entrainment values, say 0.03 per kilometer, um, the plumes have much less cape. If you think of cape as the difference, as the integrated difference between this solid line and this dashed line. And so what we find is that in these simulations, entrainment doesn't need to vary by binary or depth, and that equal entrainment works quite well. So this is a plot of the maximum potential vertical velocity associated with a given entrainment rate when the entrainment parameterization is kept basically independent of binary depth. And for all these cases, we use a condensate loading of 50%. Um, and so you can see that after you get to, say, an entrainment rate of 0.02, the lines are basically overlapping, like we saw in our CDFs previously. And so this basically tells us that uh, this kind of scheme where entrainment is independent of modular depth works very well in uh, producing the high percentile of drop velocities that we saw previously. And so if entrainment was inversely proportional to the modular depth, um, these lines would not overlap, and in fact, they cross in an X as opposed to overlapping. And so these are my Bowen ratio take home messages. Mm -hmm. The first is that we test the response of convective intensity to surface Bowen ratio in a cloud dissolving model. We found that high intensity updrafts are not sensitive to Bowen ratio, and that our results could be explained by entrainment that is insensitive to boundary air depth. So next, I'm gonna be talking about a mechanism that could potentially alter the overall cape. So this previous uh, study was kind of suggesting that we're looking at different entraining capes, so different effective capes in our cases. But our idea is that if you can just increase the overall cape over land, even if they're still in training, you're gonna still have more effective cape if you increase the overall cape. Um, so this is testing the enhanced diurnal cycle over land and whether it can result in greater cape when interacting with a free troposphere that is influenced by oceanic convection. Um, so we know that the, the diurnal cycle and surface temperature is higher over land. Um, so the question is, does this actually result in enhanced cape? There is a way that it can. So oceanic convection uh, will influence the free troposphere temperature profile over basically all the tropics through gravity wave propagation. This is the weak temperature gradients. Um, so you can think of some time early in the day before convection has occurred over land. Convection could still be occurring over the ocean. And so it's uh, launching a plume, it launches a parcel, and then because the parcel equi equilibrates its temperature with the environment, uh, the parcel path is setting the environmental temperature path. But then over land, we get some surface heating with the diurnal cycle. And so we have this new surface temperature. And if we had the same dew point temperature as before, we would raise this parcel, and then we get this extra cape associated with the free troposphere that has been influenced by oceanic convection. This is also illustrated in this following figure. So this is a kind of a diagram of surface characteristics. So this is surface water vapor mixing ratio, and this is surface temperature, and so the contours here are cape, and I used a static free troposphere, so I calculated the cape for a ton of combinations, but in every single combination I used the exact same free troposphere temperature profile, and so this lets us see how cape changes with those combinations. So for a constant water vapor mixing ratio, it's pretty obvious as you increase the surface temperature, you're going to be increasing the cape. And for a constant relative humidity, the same thing is true, although you're going to be increasing your cape at a greater rate because naturally then water vapor increases as temperature increases. So if we expect our RH or QB to stay constant in our simulation, 
we would expect k to increase. And these are my diurnal cycle take home messages. The first is our test hypothesis that uh, the diurnal cycle over land leads to keep explaining the land ocean contrast and convective intensity. Um, we find that the diurnal cycle only produces precipitation enhancement. So the amount of rainfall over our island, over our simulation, increases with the diurnal cycle. But the actual convective intensities are unchanged when you control for the amount of precipitation. We also find that CAPE does not actually increase. And this is due to boundary or quasi-equilibrium. As the surface gets heated, low homoestatic energy air is fluxed into the boundary layer. Um, and we find it's mainly contributed by convective downdrops in our simulation. So how do we test this diurnal cycle uh, mechanism? Just like in our previous case, we use uh, cloud absorbing model simulations. In this case, we use island simulations in radiative convective equilibrium. So our domain previously was the square box. Now it's a very long and narrow kind of a bowling alley where half the domain is an island, so it has 512 kilometers in the x direction are islands, and 512 kilometers in the x direction are ocean. And by island, all I mean is that I'm changing the, the surface temperature with time of day, so it has a diurnal cycle on surface temperature, while I'm keeping the ocean's surface temperature fixed with time of day. Um, and so this is, if the oceanic uh, convection is influencing the free troposphere, our moisture is constant and our surface is heating, we will expect to see the cave differences, but we do not see that and I'll show you why. Um, the first thing is a challenge that we have, that is that islands exhibit precipitation enhancement that can bias convective intensity results. This is a Hobbler diagram, so going down the y-axis is time, and the x-axis is the domain. We can kind of, um, this is precipitation, sorry. Um, we can, just by the eyeball test here, there's more rainfall on this left-hand side of the domain than there is on the right-hand side. We can also see that the left-hand side of this domain is more constrained in time for its precipitations than it is on the right-hand side, and that's because, as you might have guessed, this left-hand side is our island, while the right-hand side is our ocean. If you have more convection occurring over a domain, and then you just sample at a certain percentile, you're gonna to expect to see higher updraft velocities, just because you're gonna be sampling more convection. And this is the case. So, again, we have a TDF, so this is the highest percentile of updraft velocities down here. Before accounting for the differences in precipitation, our island has stronger updraft velocities than our ocean. Um, we do find that this is because there's just more convection occurring over our island. And so, uh, we've come up with some solutions to account for the amount of precipitation occurring in our domain. The first is Poisson sampling, where, where we resample the domain mean precipitation data so that the island has the same mean precipitation as the ocean. This is different from resampling every single grid point and that every single grid point is going to be very directly tied to updraft velocities, but if you resample the domain mean, you're going to get a different statistic. And so this is kind of giving us a way to compare um, what islands would look like if they had the same mean precipitation as the ocean. We also resample domain mean PDFs of precipitation, so the island has the same mean precipitation PDF as the ocean, and this is called stratified sampling. The point is to remember that in the real world, lightning is insensitive to the amount of precipitation, so if we had convective intensity contrasts, even after the sampling, we would expect there to be higher updrafts over our island than over our ocean. After sampling, we find that there is no convective intensity contrast, though there are differences between instantaneous and time averaged output. So instantaneous output is basically snapshots out of our model every 30 minutes, while as time averaged output is the average uh, data over those 30 minutes. This left-hand side of CDF includes the unadjusted, so this is before Poisson sampling island, uh, the Poisson sampled island, so that it has the same mean precipitation as the ocean, and our ocean. And we can see that beforehand, the island has greater updraft velocities, but once you account for the differences in mean precipitation, those differences go away. Are you in any way accounting for the mesoscale circulations land sea breeze associated with the islands? No. So you're assuming the island, I mean, typically when you look at precipitation over islands, it's concentrated in the land sea breeze front. Yes. Right. So it's going to be occurring over the islands, so, right? Um, it'll be occurring over the islands, but it'll be enhanced by a mesoscale lifting. Okay. Over um, the island. Sure, so that gives you more precipitation, I'm assuming, right? Or, I guess I'm not, 
Well, yeah. Lancy circulation. Yeah, that occurs. Yeah, they're in the that's what I'm asking. Yeah, it, it's oh. in there. Yeah, they exist. Uh, by accounting for them, I assume you're asking some statistical like sampling. No, I'm, yeah. I'm just asking if you're accounting for. for Our simulations have Lancy degrees interactions. interactions. Okay. Yes. And they do just like if I showed you a spatial domain, there's a like a specific location over Island that has more rainfall than the other locations. Okay. Um, and so for time average output, Poisson sampling doesn't actually work as well. So this is the Poisson sampled island again, and you can see that in time averaging, but just accounting for the mean doesn't do as well. But if you account for the whole PDF precipitation, it does do well, and that's because over an island, precipitation is more tightly constrained in time, so you're more likely to get high intensity events adjacent to each other, and so if you average, you're going to be keeping more high intensity events. If you're curious about this, I have a figure in the supplemental slide that describes it better. Um, but yeah, after stratified sampling and the time average output, we do again see that the convective intensities over island and ocean are about the same. We can also apply these sampling techniques to trim data. Um, so using 2A25 overpasses co-located with LIS flash rates, um, we can apply both Poisson and stratified sampling using, using an oceanic domain as control. So I chose 160 east to 80 east and 5 north to 5 south as my control region. I took the mean precipitation from that region and then resampled every single grid point so that it had the same mean precipitation. I then looked at what lightning would look like if every single grid point had that mean precipitation. And so this is the Poisson sample lightning. So every single grid point here that isn't white has the same mean precipitation value. And we can quite clearly see there's still a very obvious land ocean contrast. This makes sense because some of the rainiest places on Earth are over the ocean. And so we're actually increasing the lightning in a lot of places. And that's this figure here. So this is the ratio of this Poisson sample lightning to the original lightning figure I gave. Um, so two is doubling the amount of lightning. And clearly, almost everywhere over continents, you're more than doubling the amount of lightning, and that's because you're greatly increasing the amount of precipitation. Um, so for stratified sampling, I again took the same region, but I gave it a PDF of precipitation, and then I resampled every single grid point again, so it has the same mean PDF of precipitation at every single grid point. Um, this gives a different result, but the overall conclusion is the same, that uh, land and ocean land is kind of insensitive to the amount of precipitation you're forcing onto it. Uh, there's still quite a clear land ocean contrast in lightning activity. But now the amount of lightning has decreased over a lot of areas. Um, in some areas it's decreasing as much as 50 or 60 percent. So that's not nearly enough to explain the orders of magnitude contrast in lightning flash rate. So just going back one slide, we just need to remember that our convective intensities aren't changing. And so why is that? Um, it turns out that convective intensity isn't enhanced because Cape isn't greater over our island. Um, this left-hand side y-axis here is Cape in joules per kilogram. The dashed line is our oceanic Cape, so the uh, mean Cape over our ocean domain, whereas the solid line is the island Cape. Uh, the x-axis is time of day, so I've composited 25 model days together. We can see at times when precipitation is occurring, that is this red line, this is precipitation over our island, at times when precipitation is occurring, or even building up to some extent, isn't higher over our island as compared to over our ocean. And so our question is, why is this? What's TOD? Uh, time of day. So this is 3 p.m. This is 8 p.m. Oh, no, it's relative to surface temperature max, yeah. Uh, the x factor yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's, you can kind of die, you can give any time of day as long as they can. Yeah. yeah, you just, you have to describe the, the sine, sine wave. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. surface temperature maximizes at noon, basically, is the point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so we don't see our predicted heat differences. Why is that? It turns out that water vapor near the surface is actually decreasing as our temperature increases. So this is kind of that same contour plot that I showed previously. And this is the water vapor mixing ratio for uh, versus surface temperature for that time, or for that for our island domain. We can see that for a lot of our surface higher surface temperatures, uh, the water vapor actually decreases a lot, and so our capes aren't actually increasing. We can also see this in the contour plot of moist static energy. So the contours here are moist static energy and Kelvin. Uh, this red line is our surface heat flux, that is this right hand side y-axis. It kind of naturally matches the surface temperatures. But you can see that as our, sensible, as our surface heat flux increases with time of day, except for this initial bump, the moist static energies are not increasing. And so we diagnose the reasons for this uh, kind of static 
moist static energy over a layer using a moist static energy budget. Um, and so we apply a continuity equation for our island's boundary layer. Uh, this term here is basically the time rate of change of moist static energy over our island. This left-hand term is the fluxes into and out of our boundary layer. So this is a surface integral over our boundary layer. Um, this term is our surface fluxes. This term is the radiative cooling in our bench layer, and there's some residual associated with it, like, taking up snapshots to calculate this variable. Um, and so the real interesting variable here, we know that this is close to zero already, is this uh, surface integral here. We can kind of partition it the three components. The first is the tor total horizontal flux. So that's the stuff coming in and out of the sides of our uh, island. So it's not over the whole domain, so over half the domain, so there's some flux in and out. There's a vertical flux of mean flow. And then there's an eddy flux of moist static energy out of the top of the boundary layer. And so these two terms are separated using Reynolds averaging, where the total is the sum of these two out of the top. So do you mean to say that there's no diurnal variability of theta e over the island? Very small, yeah. Mm. I, I, don't, I don't buy that. <laughs> Here's the thing. Well, I mean, yeah, that's your model. I, 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 I just don't, I, I don't think that rings true to me with I'll have a figure at the end that kind of has some qualitative evidence for it actually being true. A figure from analysis. Here. So if I go to Hawaii in the afternoon, it's not any more hot and humid than it is It's, it's hotter. The surface temperature, the temperature. But the theta e doesn't go up in the afternoon. It might. It doesn't in our simulation. Yeah, I know it doesn't in your simulation, but I'm saying in reality. It might, but it's, we don't know that. Like, have you measured the theta e at times a day over Hawaii? I guess I don't want to get into that argument, but. Uh, I mean, I, this I is think a very it's an important case, argument I guess. because I mean, if I'm, if I'm at Disney World well, sure. in the afternoon, it gets pretty times. humid and hot. Yeah. It would be during conducting time. So yeah, yeah. I guess you need convection to balance this out. Yeah. Okay. We'll, we'll talk about it later. Mm -hmm. um, but so yeah, we apply a moist energy budget to our boundary layer, um, and we find that. So I'll, I'll describe this first. Uh, the saw blue line here is the change in moist static energy of our boundary layer versus time. This orange line is surface flexes. This tiny yellow line here is the radiative cooling effect. K is the sum of that total horizontal flux and the mean flux of the vertical. Um, w prime H prime is that eddy flux term. And R, this light blue line, is our residual. Um, you can pretty clearly see that the W prime H prime, the eddy flux, is the term that's balancing our surface flexes in this area. Um, so then what is making up this W prime H prime? Is it associated with convection or entrainment or what? Um, so we've separated out components um, from net positive and negative mass flux to uh, identify basically the things that are making up this W prime H prime term. So if you separate out the net positive and negative mass flux, you have an upward flow and a downward flow, and you can find the eddy fluxes associated with those. So then we can say W prime H prime is made up of some area fraction upward, some mass flux perturbation upwards, and some anomalous moist static energy upwards. Um, and this is taken relative to the second model level, which is what we're using to calculate our parcels for K. And then it's also made up of some area fraction downwards, some perturbation mass flux downwards, and some uh, moist static energy anomaly downwards. And so these four figures here give us the information about these terms. Uh, this first figure is just the total of each of these terms. So the blue line here is the downward contribution to our eddy flux. The orange line is the upward contribution. And this yellow line is the total. Um, you can very obviously see that downward flow is what's giving the main contribution to the total flow. The area fraction of the downward net mass flux is larger than the upward. Um, that's not too surprising, though. At all times of day when convection is occurring, these area fractions aren't really changing. The mass flux in our upward flow is quite a bit greater than our downward flow. But because basically all other variables, so area fraction and then moist static energy anomaly, are larger uh, for the downward flow, the net contribution from this downward flow is greater than the net contribution from this upward flow. However, this partition only gives us upwards and downwards flow. We can think of upwards flow as basically the contribution from updrafts, because entrainment in this case is going to be downwards to graded cooling. Um, so we didn't solve for a maximum possible entrainment contribution using a dry static energy budget at the top of the boundary layer. And so dry static energy is just temperature and geopotential converting to energy units. So then what contributions can come from our environment? 
Uh, here's our dry stack energy budget. We have a change in dry stack energy with time. Using a scale analysis, we can remove the contributions from the horizontal terms. Um, and then here's a vertical emission term. So this is vertical velocity times uh, the change in dry stack energy with height. And this is a, a balanced rate rating pool. Uh, this is the same blue line that we saw in the previous top left hand figure. And then this is the entrainment calculated, or the maximum possible entrainment calculated uh, by this dry static energy budget. And we can see that for most times of day, entrainment isn't contributing that much to the overall downward flow. Um, at noon, it's contributing about 40%. And so the maximum total contribution from entrainment, entrainment or the environment. Uh, it could be about 25% of the total flux, uh, sorry, the total eddy flux. Um, this is somewhat in contrast to previous studies which had suggested that entrainment was the main contributor, but they were diagnosing the contributions from entrainment by looking at specific velocities of parcels, whereas we're using the actual budget of uh, dry static energy to diagnose our entrainment. So it really could be that a lot of our downdrafts are just moving quite slowly, and our actual result isn't really disagreeable. Is, is your entrainment calculation based on a one-dimensional model? No, it's just based off the dry static energy budget from the information in our simulation. So this is the change in dry static energy. From the cloud model. From our cloud model. And you have, and you have horizontal resolution of one kilometer. Of one kilometer as well as five And how deep is your um, boundary layer? It's uh, 700 meters. How much? 700 meters. 700 meters. So your boundary layer is not as deep as your horizontal resolution. Correct. So you, you basically got a one-dimensional model. Yeah, this equation. Well, sorry, I should. I mean, uh, this equation is not really sensitive to the resolution of the simulation. This is just the dry static energy budget. So this is basically information from the total island area. It doesn't. Right, but but your individual eddies. Oh, we're not sampling individual eddies. It's all. Be, it's just your parameterization. It's a calculation associated with. From your turbulence kinetic energy. Simulation is that where it's coming from? Um, your 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 energy budget is yeah is is, is a turbulence energy budget. Okay. Is that's that's what I'm asking? Oh. Is that what it is from your turbulence kinetic energy parameterization? Uh, no, this is just a definition, right? This is the dry static energy budget. The, if you have rated cooling, you'll get these terms, and then you can diagnose the. Okay, so so it's based on the things you resolve. Yes. But you only resolve one kilometer, and you have a 700 meter deep boundary layer. But we don't need to resolve everything in the boundary layer to get these terms, I guess? Well, you, I'm sure you can give terms, but do, do they mean anything if you don't resolve individual large eddies? I mean, at least using this methodology is somewhat novel in that we've got a way to diagnose an entrainment that is different from what previous people have done. Their previous work of like, if vertical velocity is greater than one meter per second, it's entrainment. If it's less than one, or is, if vertical velocity is less than one meter per second, it's entrainment. If it's greater, it's not entrainment. These are more qualitative and less accurate estimations than what we're doing, I would say. And so we. I wouldn't say. I mean, I, I mean, but you, you don't have very much resolution. But they use really. the same resolution or worse resolution than us. Well, that's not a justification. The point mm -hmm. is, I think I think Greg is asking a more general question about resolution. Okay. Uh, okay. I mean, I'm not I'm, asking about this particular equation. Like this particular equation doesn't depend on the resolution. Maybe a way to rephrase it is you expect that your results you get from your model simulation might be sensitive to the resolution you choose. It could be, but not this equation specifically, I would say. Uh, the updraft velocity results are, we know, are sensitive to model resolution. Uh, mouse fluxes are probably sensitive to model resolution, but the qualitative results that we've seen in our high, in our one kilometer resolution versus 500 meter resolution simulation. Certainly, the, the, the entrainment and mixing of large eddies is highly dependent on resolution. Yes. Which the, is why when you do large eddy simulations, you have 20 meters resolution. Right? You're right. using one kilometer resolution. So, it should we just not do these things? Should we just. Well, I don't know if there's any, any skill in simulating this kind of turbulence. But so, should we just not spend time to develop the methodology then to analyze this sort of stuff? Should we? Well, the methodology uh, may have some application, but I don't know if the results with one kilometer resolution are useful. Can I suggest that this might be a good discussion for the, uh, the committee? Yeah, we'll leave it for later. Go ahead, just keep going. <laughs> um, and so, now we're going to read, so 
we diagnosed that entrainment is contributing a relatively small portion of our total eddy flux. Um, when looking at quantiles of CAPE using reanalysis data, so this is kind of another way to look at the influence of this uh, diurnal cycle and surface temperature. So we're using four times daily ERA interim data over ten year, or over eight years. Excuse me. Um, this data should capture the characteristics of the diurnal cycle and should show at high percentiles that CAPE is higher over land than over the ocean if there is this impact of the diurnal cycle. What we see is that land doesn't actually have higher CAPEs than it does over the ocean. Um, this is the 75th percentile of CAPE over land and ocean. The highest values are over the west of the North Pole approximately. At the 99th percentile, the differences are still pretty small. The highest CAPEs are over India, over uh, the Indian Ocean, but there is no clear land ocean contrast in CAPE that you'd expect to see if this was the thing that was explaining all And it is important to remember that there's no single quantile that is determining convection. So we can't say that, oh, the 75th percentile of CAPE is what really matters, or the 99th percentile of CAPE is what really matters. There's some CAPE associated with some convection, but you can't say what quantile it is. And so these are my diurnal cycle take home messages. The first is that we tested the hypothesis that the diurnal cycle leads to CAPE explaining the land ocean contrast and convective intensity. Uh, the next is that the diurnal cycle only produces precipitation enhancement. So we showed that precipitation was increased over our islands, but we, when we control for that, the updraft velocities in our simulations are unchanged. And then finally, CAPE is not increasing, and this is due to bound layer closet equilibrium. As the surface is getting heated over our island, uh, low moist static energy air associated with convection is flexed into the boundary layer, keeping our moist static energy static. So finally, I'll get into a mechanism that could actually explain, well, explain. This does show differences in CAPE as well as convective intensity. And it works in a variety of cases. However, more work is needed to connect this mechanism to lightning. Um, and so this is an examination of how saturation deficit affects convection. So saturation deficit can also be thought of as free tropospheric dryness. Um, increased saturation deficit has been shown to result in greater CAPE in a number of papers. And we explore a variety of cases related to experiments of the previous authors, except that now we're also looking at convective intensity <coughs> and responses associated with basically that fixed amount of precipitation. So previous work had basically done warming studies now we're saying, okay, you've got increased convective intensity, but you've also got increased precipitation. Here results also show up after uh, after coming up for that precipitation. There's some other evidence that this might be relevant for land ocean contrast in convective intensity, and that is that land has a pickup in convection at a lower uh, column relative humidity than ocean. Um, however, it's important to remember that using the whole column, and this is a free tropospheric mechanism, we know that our uh, land boundary layers are much drier than our oceans, so. It's not actually clear whether these pickups are really, really different over land motion if you're just using the free troposphere uh, column mode. So how does saturation deficit uh, lead to a less stable free troposphere and greater cape? Um, this is a, another very high quality MS paint drawing. This solid blue line here is a moist static energy profile and this dashed red line is another moist static energy profile. And they both have the same surface moist static energy or boundary layer moist static energy. This gray line is a non-entraining plume basically launched from this surface by you and is conserving its moist static energy. And so we know that in the tropics, uh, convection is equilibrating its temperature with the environment. Um, and so then we can say the change in moist static energy of convective plume is the same as the temperature change of the environment. And so if we have some entrainment occurring, uh, this plume will go down to some entraining path so that, these, that is these dashed uh, blue and red lines here. And so we can think of this as the actual um, plume path, but because it has the same uh, environment, it has the same saturation moist static energy as the environment, that means it has the same temperature as the environment. And so this is actually determining our environment's temperature profile. If we then recalculate the CAPE associated with these two different temperature profiles, we see that our uh, drier simulation, that's this orange one, has some extra cape as compared to our uh, wetter simulation. That is, if you're in training and cooling your future with your temperature, um, you're gonna get more cape than if you don't. And so yeah, increased saturation deficit can lead to increased cape. So again, we start with our plume equation. We know that our plume is saturated, so its H is equal to its H star, its moist static energy is equal to its saturation moist static energy. 
we know that its H star is the same as the saturation moist static energy of the environment. So then we can replace, we can substitute in some terms. We know that the T of both of these is the same, so now we just have QD here. Um, and we can set, substitute in this H with this H star. And so now we have an equation for how the temperature in the free troposphere of the environment is changing based on the difference in saturation between the environment's uh, saturation water vapor mixing ratio and its actual water vapor mixing ratio. To, again, to then get the impact on buoyancy, we consider another plume. So this is our new updraft plume that has no entrainment, so it's gone entrained, so its DHCBC is zero. And if we then subtract this plume from the previous plume, we can get some accounting for the buoyancy, and we can see that as if you have a greater difference in this value, you're going to get a greater buoyancy than if, than if you have a smaller difference. So if you have a greater saturation deficit, you're going to have more buoyancy. And so these are our saturation deficit take-home messages. We test the response of Kate and convective intensity to enhance saturation deficit using equilibrium and field campaign simulations. Increasing the dryness of the free troposphere can result in higher Kate and does result in more intense convection, even when precipitation is not increased. So this is very different from our two previous cases where precipitation was the same and the convective intensity was the same. Now we have a case where precipitation is the same and convective intensity is very different. <clears throat> However, evidence that saturation deficit explains the contrast between land and ocean lightning is still lacking. We'll show that study kind of slide. So simulation setups, I use equilibrium simulations. However, in this case, I'm forcing the free tropospheric water vapor profile using TogoCore. So I just force the free troposphere back to some factor. Say, I use 90% of TogoCore's water vapor profile, or 75%, or I use 100% as the control. We also use directly forced field campaign simulations from Gate, TogoCore, Dynamo, TWPI, SPARMSGP, and GoAmazon. These first three field campaign simulations are all oceanic. TWPI is kind of an intermediate simulation, so this is area over land and ocean. ARM, SGP, and Go Amazon are both land simulations. So ARM, SGP is over Oklahoma and southern Kansas. Go Amazon, as you might guess, is over the Amazon. <coughs> Our equilibrium simulations, so that's what we're forcing with the background water vapor profile, uh, do have higher cape and convective intensity as you get to drier and drier cases. So the free tropospheres are slightly cooler in the dry case and have slightly less precipitation than the control case. This is again a saturation moist static energy in the dashed lines and moist static energy uh, thermodynamic diagram. This black dashed line is the 75% case. The red dashed line is the 90% case and the blue line is the control case. We know that the saturation moist static energy is proportional to temperature. And you can see that in the free troposphere, the temperature, temperatures are slightly cooler in the driest case. You can also see that the moist static energy is much lower in our dry cases as well. Mm -hmm. Question of technicality. On this. Sure. Is, is this radiative convective equilibrium over the island and over uh, the Sorry, this is a homogeneous domain simulation, so we're not using islands anymore. This is actual box. Okay. Yeah, okay. so this is not right. islands. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, and so this is just a plot of saturation deficit versus height converted into an energy unit, so we just multiply the saturation deficit by the link to the vaporization. You can pretty obviously see that the driest case has the greatest saturation deficit. And so we do find that convective intensity is higher in the dry simulation. Um, the cape in the control case, that is that 100% of typical core water vapor profile, is 2600 joules per kilogram in the mean. In the 90% case, it's 2850 joules per kilogram. And in the 75% case, it is 3050 joules per kilogram. Um, again, we're looking at cumulative distribution functions of vertical velocity. At the 99th percentile, we see that the driest case has by far the strongest vertical velocities as compared to the uh, less dry cases. We also compare results from field campaign simulations. So you can get a prediction for what cave will be from the plume model uh, based on the saturation deficit. And then you can compare how the maximum capes in our simulations compare to that uh, profile here. So these are the observed capes in our simulations at every time step versus the predicted maximum from this gray line. And so the real question is, do these dots pass this gray line very frequently? And is the maximum generally increasing with saturation deficit? And the answer to both those questions is yes. Uh, capes tend to match the screen line quite well. This is the prediction from saturation deficit. That is the maximum cape is going with the predicted maximum cape. When we compare it to the initial predictions of Singh and O'Gorman in 2013, they took observations from the Tokyo core region 
and compared it with this gray dash line here, this is their predicted maximum cape value. They also found that as you increase your saturation deficit, the maximum cape did increase. Um, this is our comparison, so I've overlaid all the field campaigns. We can see that cape increases with maximum saturation, uh, maximum cape increases with saturation. We find that convective intensity does increase with cape. So we applied Poisson sampling, that's the sampling that constrains the mean precipitation to every cape bin, so that every bin between, so the bins are 500 joules per kilogram, every bin has six millimeters per day of uh, precipitation. We found that all simulations except for TWPI, TWPIs experienced convective intensity growth with cape. So these are all the simulations. These dashed lines are the uh, confidence intervals. You can see Gil Amazon increases with increasing cape, Chilco Core increases with increasing cape, RMSGP increases with increasing cape, so most of them increase with increasing cape. If you include the confidence interval, even TWPIs could be increasing with increasing cape. Um, and so this kind of shows that the idea that saturation deficit influences cape and influences uh, convective intensity is correct. That just by having greater dryness, you can have greater convective intensity. However, Saturation deficit, uh, deficits don't appear to explain the land ocean contrast. Um, so this is a map of saturation deficit, the 99th percentile of saturation deficit, when precipitation is greater than one millimeter per day. So I used Chem 3B42 precipitation and ERA in terms of saturation deficits. And you can kind of see the outline of some continents, like here's South America, here's Africa, you can see uh, Indonesia, but the contrasts aren't the same as the land ocean contrast, that is, Saturation deficit isn't higher over tropical land, it's actually lower. Um, the only areas where saturation and deficit is high is over subtropical land areas, which makes sense. They're the driest hottest places on Earth, basically. And so these are my saturation deficit take home messages. Uh, the first is that we tested the response of CAPE and convective intensity to enhance saturation deficit using equilibrium and field campaign simulations. The next is that increase in the dryness of the free troposphere can result in higher cape and more intense convection, even when precipitation is not increased. So we showed that our precipitation is not increasing in these equilibrium simulations, but the convective intensity is increasing. This is important because in our two previous RCE simulations, we had the same amount of precipitation, but we couldn't get the convective intensities to differ. So being able to show that convective intensity can change is pretty important. Um, and then evidence that saturation deficit, evidence that saturation deficits explain this land ocean contrast is still lacking. That map that I showed previously showed that saturation deficit probably doesn't explain the land ocean contrast. So then what could be causing this land ocean contrast? Um, perhaps extremely high resolution simulations are needed to properly resolve entrainment, as you suggested. Uh, again, our islands are extremely idealized, so the only thing we've given our island is a diurnal cycle in temperature. We didn't give it topography or surface roughness or anything like that. All we gave it was a diurnal cycle. Perhaps those characteristics are necessary to produce the convective intensity contrast. Dryness clearly has the potential to contribute, but it's not really clear that it's a mechanism that can explain this geographic variations in convective intensity. And then aerosols might matter, but that's a matter of future study. Uh, thank you so much. So then I have a lot of people I would like to thank. The first is my advisor, Larissa Bach, for basically supporting me and hiring me and guiding me. Uh, you basically turned me from somebody who only wanted to play with his toy model <laughs> that wasn't that interested in scientific questions to somebody who cares more about the scientific questions than his toy model. So thank you so much. I really appreciate that you've been this whole time. Uh, the next people I'd like to uh, thank are my PhD <coughs> committee, uh, Greg, Grant, Anker, and uh, Sam. Uh, thank you so much for being patient with me and guiding me. Uh, thank you for all your advice, and I, I really, really appreciate it. I'd next like to thank my wife, Harmony. Uh, I don't think I would have finished grad school without you. I appreciate you so much, and I love you. You're really, really awesome. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank my research group, so Vidjit and Miguel. Thank you for being here and being fun and awesome and fun to work with. Uh, also, thanks to Cooney for teaching me how to read scientific papers well, and thanks for, to Jean for getting me to work really hard. Uh, I'd like to thank the AOS staff, so Sue, uh, Dee, Sonia, and Chelsea. Thank you so much for kind of making sure I've been able to get through grad school smoothly. I'd also like to thank Pete quite a bit. I don't is he here? Oh, there he is. I think, thank you so much. I don't think I could have gotten a lot of my technical details solved without you, or it would have taken maybe an extra year or two for my PhD. So thank you so much for your help. 
I would like to thank my friends and family. Thank you for being here. Thank my mom and dad who aren't here, but will be in a couple weeks. Um, yeah, thank you all so much. Yeah, and so questions? Any questions first? <laughs> <laughs> so these possibilities, what do you think are the most prominent? I'm, I've always kind of been stuck on the Bowen ratio one. And just like, so there's been observations that deeper boundary layers have increasing lightning, but the question is, is it correlation or just causation? So there's been papers that like, oh, deeper boundary layers over land have more lightning than deeper boundary, uh, than shallower boundary layers over the ocean. I kind of wonder that maybe you need like a 10 meter resolution simulation of a large domain to really capture the effects of entrainment and increasing boundary layer depth. Um, that's something that's worth doing. However, there's recently been a paper that kind of throws the whole idea in the uh, question. There was a paper by Walter Hanna where he just tested the impact of different widths of clouds on, on entrainment, and he found that really wide clouds still entrain a lot, even compared to really narrow clouds, so the width doesn't matter that much. So kind of maybe sad, but narrows down the Mechanism possibly the islands. If you change the Bowen ratio, maybe uh, the impact of the increased surface heat, uh, sensible heat flux instead of latent heat flux, could be pretty promising. We know that temperatures actually are increasing with time of day, so the moist static energy is constant because the moisture is decreasing. The temperature is actually increasing. So if you put most of the fluxes into sensible heat flux, maybe you would get a heat increase. But yeah, I, I still kind of am stuck on the Bowen ratio. Uh, he used 100 meter resolution, and he was <coughs> unwilling to go lower than that just for computational purposes. And we did 200 meter resolution simulations and not give it to the agreed result. And he compared the impact of 200 meter versus 100 meter, and he found those no If you had higher resolution simulations, what would you do differently in terms of diagnosing them? I wouldn't diagnose them differently, I think. I would use the same tools that I used in these studies. Um, Maybe I would consider using Lagrangian parcels just to like get the exact values, but I think the tools we developed are pretty useful in any resolution. I'm gonna throw out one question that I wasn't sure if it was made on, but it's if you look at the lightning flash rate, you get a log logarithmic max, so it's a little hard to see the contrast, but in my experience, you tend to see high lightning rates not only over the continents, but to slightly like downwind of the continents, yeah. up to a few hundred kilometers. Uh, I'll get back to the very first slide and show. But it's especially clear over the SPCZ. Yeah, but you also see it downwind of North America, South America, and then to the west of the, of so the they, tropical land masses. Yeah. And so what does that possibly imply for the role of the Bowen Ratio and other land sea things if you're still seeing this effect? some distance beyond the shore. It does limit the impact. So it could be mixed mechanisms. So, I mean, obviously no one mechanism is going to swing the whole thing. So perhaps there is some combination of aerosols and uh, dinocycle or aerosols and bone issue that matter. Um, in terms of the lightning, a lot of what you're seeing is downstream enhancement of precip. Right, because you see uh, over the Gulf Stream there, yeah, yeah. enhancement of precip. I, I guess, yeah, if you divide by the amount of precipitation, you no longer see that enhancement. Yeah, well, I don't know. I had a paper in 1994, I think it was, 95, that looked at the ratio of occurrence of lightning to occurrence of precipitation, and that ratio showed a pretty dramatic gradient that did extend offshore a fair amount, downwind typically in each case. So, of course, that was frequency of yeah. yeah, I mean, I guess. We didn't really think about it because this kind of dividing by precipitation so easily removed that offshore gradient. Um, by frequency, I guess, maybe thunderstorm frequency is not a better way to think about it than thunderstorm like precipitation intensity, but precipitation intensity we know is convective to convective intensity. So maybe there is some mechanism, and I guess it would be sea breezes or land breezes that we are causing this convective intensity. Thank you. So um, after Zach's uh, hopefully successful defense, we'll um, head over to the set and have a reception there. So, yeah. Mm -hmm.